Welcome to Aspiring Hollywood. I'm Luciano Saber. Today we have another special episode for you with our special guest. A lot of special things here today. Chris Hamill, who works for Pixworld Distribution. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So what I want to talk to you about today is the exit strategy, because a lot of filmmakers, independent filmmakers, I should say, um, are so excited and so caught up about their script, about their story, about directing, about producing, doing all these great, phenomenal things. I know because I'm one of them. And, and uh, you know, you get caught up in the lights and the sound and all this stuff, but you never think about how am I going to recuperate my money? Absolutely right. And, and the first rule that I would uh, give any aspiring filmmaker, any filmmaker for that matter, is that Distrib if you control distribution, you control everything. And you control your future. You certainly do. Right? Because if you at least break even on your budget and you, and you give your investors their money back, then most likely they invest in your, in your next project. That's absolutely right? right. And to piggyback on what you're saying, I think aspiring filmmakers, beginning filmmakers, should really look at their first production as something that isn't necessarily going to yield them much or any money at all, but essentially give them that next opportunity um, down the road, whereas it, th that they can at least get their, um, their film exposed, get it onto the, to the shelves, you know, in the retail stores. That should probably be their first focus for their first several films, so they can get some va validation from Hollywood to get them to that next level. And unfortunately, in those situations, they're probably going to have to rely on uh, money from friends and family and that sort of thing. <laughs> We're all familiar with that process, right? Sure. At, at some point or another. And, and again, the other element of distribution or what drives ticket sales or foreign sales is star power. Absolutely. But if I'm an independent filmmaker, I'm just starting out, I don't have the connection to, to stars. You know, what can I do to at least, at least get my money back and get the film on the shelves? Well, again, a lot of that has to do with, with again, it, it goes back to distribution and it goes back to um, the, the um, I guess, the relationships you can build with, with talking to uh, some of the smaller distributors. And as I, as I said, if they believe in the project enough, or at least what, what you're gonna put together, um, even with no names, so to speak, in terms of actors, um, you, you, you can at least get um, a distribution uh, entity behind you. Um, you. You can get it into the stores, again, get it into some of the smaller uh, mom and pop stores that are kind of going away. Mm -hmm. but, but that's what you need to focus on. And, and focus on the fact that if you can somehow get some type of M, what we call an MG or minimum guarantee, which is what a distributor uh, will basically buy the rights to distribute your film for. Understand this, that's all the money you'll ever see. <laughs> um, we know as a fact, and any filmmaker knows, that um, once they sign that contract on the dotted line with the distributor, they're never seeing another penny. That's it. They're I, not I, gonna see well, any overages. I, I, I have, ex and I'm not gonna go into details, but I, I can totally relate. And Adjusted gross, forget about it, right? Don't, <laughs> you'll never see a penny, correct? Exactly. Any gross, any net, yeah. you call what you want, you'll never see anything else again. Right. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll say this, that's the one thing that, that I want to stress here for any filmmaker, is that if you make the mistake of not focusing on distribution uh, during pre-production or, or prior to uh, getting the film together and, and decide that you're going to focus on distribution after you have a finished product, you're dead in the water. Yeah, I it's agree. Simple as that. And, and, and that's exactly what I did with, with one of my films um, where I, but at that point I had the connections uh, in, in town and I was able to consult with, with various distribution houses. But what if I don't have the connections? You know, right. what do I do? How would I approach you if I didn't know you? How would I approach you and say, look, I have a script I want to shoot? Well, again, it, it's, it's one of these situations where um, a, a, it, it's going to have to take some luck. It's going to have to take um, some real persistence. 
Um, because you're talking about a scenario where you don't have a, a finished product. You're talking about you're in the preliminary stages. Sure. Um, you're, this, that script's going to have to be extremely strong. Right. Because not only you're in the preliminary stages, but you're not known. Right. You don't have access to any stars. You don't have a lot of money. Like you said, maybe friends and, and family put a few thousand dollars together, right? So it seems like the odds are stacked up against you, but there's got to be a way. Well, right, right. right. And, and what I'm saying, I guess, is it depends on what stage we're talking about. As I said, if it's your first picture, again, you're probably doing it on a, on a shoestring budget anyway. Uh, again, I would not focus on expecting that to get picked up. I would expect to get yourself some extremely good footage. Um, uh, uh, make a good quality product. And when we can do that these days with the technology we have. Sure you know, um, get that product uh, in, into a state where you can, you know, put together a trailer that somebody's going to lean forward and look at. Right. Uh, and, and again, you, you'll need to get to all the major distributors that, that you can. Um, small, smaller shops, you know, larger ones. Um, again, you know, we, we've seen the paranormal activities of the world. We've seen the player which is um, you know, come out of nowhere, um, right. even Little Miss Sunshine. So uh, that can happen, but it's, but it's going to have to take a lot of work to show something that is going to make somebody s sit up in their chair. And let me, let me ask you this. I'll put you on the spot now. You guys at PixWorld, would you uh, take a phone call or, a, or an email from an independent producer that, or, or director that says, I have a script, would you read it? Um, we're, at this point, we, we wouldn't necessarily, with, with a lesser known or, or, or n no name or, or not known, um, because at this point, we're sort of uh, shifting our focus right now at PixWorld. Uh, this came about through an opportunity that, that was brought to us uh, to look or uh, obtain financing for uh, a, a very... Um, uh, the sequel to a very well-known and very successful um, uh, project that was done um, years ago. And uh, it, it has the elements in place for us to be able to now go on to the uh, foreign pre-sales market. Um, and, and again, to dovetail into kind of what we're talking about and the importance now of, of what we're seeing in, uh, in film today is that a lot of times a a film, specifically a high profile film, that has the elements in terms of, and, and the first element, and I'll tell you what the foreign uh, distributors are looking for is uh, domestic distribution. Um, really? Do you have significant de uh, distribution uh, domestically and a theatrical release and who's in it? Now what they do and is, is basically uh, go their little black book when you tell them, hey look, you know, I. I, you know, we're talking to Brad Pitt's people, we're, you know, so-and-so is attached, um, and they go in their little black book and they'll basically be able to say, okay, we will uh, obtain the rights to distribute this film in our territory for X amount of dollars. So they already have the stars associated with how much money they're going to pay. Exactly, for, for exactly, picture. exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's like the, uh, if, if anyone knows how Avi Lern, who Avi Lerner is, of course. and, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, how he built you know, what he has, I mean, it, it basically comes to the point where he doesn't even look at scripts. He doesn't look at anything other than who's distributing it, or, you know, potentially he could be, or, and, and who's in it, okay? And, and, I, and I say this because a lot of times, and God bless, you know, the, the creative filmmakers that, that uh, you know, have a great script and, and, and promote the heck out of it. It really just comes down to distribution and who's in your film or who, right. who, who do you potentially have committed to it. Right. And again, the, the reason why I bring up foreign pre-sales is because this is how you can fund a film. You can fund a film 100% through foreign pre-sales if it has the right elements involved. Right, and let's, and let's explain that to the audience because maybe some audience members don't quite understand what foreign pre-sales are. Sure. And, and, and that is essentially selling the rights to the territory, in a, in a specific territory, I should say, prior to even producing the film. And that's selling the rights based on, on, on like you said, the star power, the script, or, or uh, you know, other elements that, that they find valuable in that territory. Exactly. And, and basically, uh, what you're able to do, and again, you don't have to have these, these stars signed, sealed, and delivered, and as we know, uh, you don't until the funding is there. Exactly. Uh, 
uh, you really don't. You, you can have their interest and they'll say that if my schedule's free, I can certainly make myself available to be a part of this picture, but that's the limit to what you can tell. Exactly. But everybody understands that. And, exactly. and so, so essentially what you do is, is, is you, um, you basically have a, a foreign sales agent, and in this case, PixWorld. We can go, due to the, the relationship we've established over the years with the, the, the various distributors in the various uh, regions of the world, we can go with go to them, and basically negotiate um, the, the the value of of what uh, they're going to pay to take the rights to distribute that film in that territory. And so basically, you 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 um, you negotiate a contract. Right. You you there's a value put on that contract, and you basically accumulate all your contracts from all the different territories across the world. And you, you and you what you can do is you can go to a um, a bank. Uh, an, uh, an international bank that delves in this this right. specific business, and they will buy your contracts at a discount, maybe 80, 85 cents on the dollar. On the dollar, yeah. Now yeah. you got your money to get going right. with your pre right. with your pre production. Let, let me ask you this: Speaking of budget, what is there a preference out there in the foreign market, film versus video? I shouldn't say video, digital, because now we're, we're in the high def age, right? So right. What, do they still prefer the 35 millimeter or the Super 16 versus the, uh, uh, the digital format? No, I, I don't think any of that r really is, is, is much of an issue. Okay. Um, it, it, again, it's, it's just the elements that we discussed. Okay, what about this? What about uh, 3D versus 2D? Is 3D now the new, the new hot 3D, thing? 3D, 3D, in, in my opinion, and, and from what I've seen, um, it's, it's come about, I think, too quickly. Um, I, I, I believe that there's, there's been a lot of glitches, not only with regard to, um, you know, its, its ability to, to get into all of the theaters across certainly not only the United States, but the world, to be in the proper format to provide 3D. Um, at this point, we're going through growing pains with regard to that. Um, but there's also, uh, the, the, the technology itself is something that, that, that really hasn't caught on with, with the general public, mm -hmm. I still believe. There's, there's, I've talked to a lot of different people that, that say and suggest that certain movies they've seen in 3D, they, they would have rather seen it in 2D. Right. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still going through a growing process in that regard. What about uh, genre? Is there a specific genre? Is it horror that's, that's selling these days? Is it police uh, action, psychological thrillers? Right. Um, well, in the international market, you're always going to have um, the action adventures. All, action is always going to be um, a, a hot commodity. And, of course, it's the most expensive one to, uh, to essentially uh, create. Right. Um, however, um, you, you, you also have, uh, you know, horror is always going to be something that is always going to be, uh, um, you know, in demand. Right. Um, depending on, obviously, how, how well it's written. And that's, and that's really what it comes down to. We, we get, let's, I, I want filmmakers to understand that just because they may not have a genre that is considered, um, you know, something that's, that's um, uh, necessarily in demand, the right script is in demand. I want to talk to you a little bit about film festivals. You know, what, what's your opinion on, I mean, should a f filmmaker go that route? Well, it, it depends. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, as long as they go in with their eyes wide open and they don't expect, you know, Bob and Harvey Weinstein to walk up to them and, and give them, you know, $10 million to take their film. Um, because, you know, you know, once upon a time, that's the way things were done. I mean, you, you had, uh, um, you know, distributors set up offices. And they still do. I mean, even at the AFM this year, um, where, where and deals were being done all day long. <clears throat> that's, that's not so much the case anymore because there's, we've been inundated with film festivals, um, which I, I think is, can be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, they're, they're all over the place now. Um, you know, obviously through, you know, the, the success of, of Cannes and Sundance and sure. Toronto and Try back and some others, um, but I don't want to say that that's a total waste of time. I would just say uh, choose your festivals wisely, and and as a filmmaker, and and understand what you have and what you expect. If you expect that you want to um, 
to get a distribution deal and, and an advance, then it better, in this day and age, have, I'm sorry to say, A-listers in there yeah. that, that give it, give it some, some teeth and, and that it's a great script and, and it's well done, obviously. Right. Um, but to the lesser known um, uh, filmmakers that want to go that route, um, yeah, don't expect too much other than exposure. Try to get yourself exposed and make it a networking uh, um, scenario. Yeah, an opportunity. Absolutely. And sometimes, like you were saying earlier, that's what a first time filmmaker can expect. It's just to have his film on the shelf and, and get the exposure and get that following so they can do the next one, right? Absolutely. Assuming they at least recuperate the initial investment and, and they can roll it into the next film. Yeah, well, I, again, I, I would suggest that, uh, that filmmakers don't expect to recoup any investment for, for at least two or three, maybe even four, depending on right. uh, you know, what they're doing. And well, you know, the old joke with the investor, you know, when, when the filmmaker was pitching uh, an investor and he says, look, you know, one out of five films will make money. And the investor said, well, why don't we forget about the four and just make the one that makes money? <laughs> that's absolutely right. And, and that's what we are, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, as, as, as we you know, talk about financing and what I'm seeing in terms of trying, because right now what PixWorld is doing, we, we've kind of evolved into, through, through my efforts, uh, into film financing. And, and what I'm doing is I'm tracking down investors um, to uh, obviously finance films that have been brought to my attention for me to essentially broker. Um, and, and I'm starting to see that some investors, uh, obviously given this economy, um, they want to hedge their bets. So they are looking at financing slates of films, up to five films at once. Uh, again, to hedge against what we just talked about, you know, four stinkers and, and, and one great one, as opposed to spending um, you know, on a high-profile project these days, can go anywhere between 10 to 50 million, sure. um, and and spend all their time and effort and and, and then could and be a flop. Yeah, absolutely, end, right? absolutely. Right. Well, thank you very much for joining us and for sharing this great advice with our audience at Aspiring Hollywood. And thank you guys for watching. Until next time, I'm Luciano Saber.